Hello everybody. Welcome to our next video lecture, The Landscape of Freedom, 1866 to 1876, subtitled Reconstruction in the South Carolina and Georgia Seacoast Islands. This is the What Happens Next lecture, following America's Greatest War, uh, with, as we've seen now, from reading the Sherman documents in the previous lecture with terrific destruction uh, to the land and the people especially of the South uh, with the southern surrender in the spring of 1865 the natural question was what happens next could this country put itself back together and if so on what terms recall that Abraham Lincoln called for a new birth of freedom but as of yet it was still far from clear whose freedom and what sort. As our Pulitzer Prize winning historian Eric Foner said, an old order, an old social order has been destroyed and everything is up for grabs. I want to take a look at this picture here because I think it's especially revealing of at least a partial answer to that question. This is a group of freedmen gathering for a photograph after the war. And on the one hand, I'm tempted to let you students analyze it for meaning without rushing to fill in a lot of explanation. So let me ask the question of you. As you look at this photograph, what does it suggest to you about the way the freedmen saw the meaning of the Civil War, saw the meaning of what happens next? Did you think about that for a second? And maybe even hit pause on the video right now uh, and see if you can't kind of decode the photograph as a piece of historical evidence. If it's all you had to go on, what might you conclude about the attitudes of the freed men and women, the former slaves, as they prepared to start their next journey as free people? in the United States. Alright, well, if you stop the video, congratulations. If you mold over uh, the ideas, then perfect. Uh, but I think what we see here is uh, people who are proud, clearly. They're posing for a photograph. This isn't a candid shot. They came together. It looks appear appears to be a family. It looks as if they may be related, or at least closely connected in some way. There are adults and children and men and a woman and uh, and, the, and the figure in the center in particular, the man smoking the pipe here with two children on his lap, uh, clearly seems to be a kind of patriarch, maybe a father figure in this, this frame. Uh, so in every way, uh, a basic identity that had been denied them in slavery. Uh, that kind of pride of ownership over one's family, one's friends. You know, there was no particular law that granted slaves any rights over even their own families. A husband could be sold away from a wife, a child from its mother. Uh, but it seems clear here that the freed people of Richmond, Virginia, are ready now to reclaim those basic rights as parents, as spouses, now as free people and how revealing you can still see the destruction of the building in the background. So amidst the ruins then, a new birth of freedom. For many years the story of Reconstruction was told in the guise of romantic uh, and sentimental reconciliation in this country and, and thus Reconstruction was de-emphasized in fact uh, and we'll see why as we go through but one of the reasons uh, why Reconstruction was often given short shrift in the telling of the post-Civil War period, particularly by Southern historians, is that the freedmen themselves took very seriously the idea that they were somehow now responsible and prepared to be free people. It was easier to think of the freedmen, the former slaves, as somehow being uh, bereft of their own agency, that is, that they were somehow too ignorant, too poor, too unprepared to really be free people and that therefore Reconstruction somehow rushed them into something, you know, that the, the transition was too abrupt from slavery to freedom, but 
when we go back and we look at what the freedmen themselves said and did, it seems that they were not of that opinion whatsoever. That that was a, a view foisted upon them by uh, resentful whites. Listen to Martin Delaney. Martin Delaney was a free black northerner who quickly uh, appeared in the South after the war, on this occasion giving a talk to a group of 500 freed slaves on St. Helena Island in South Carolina just three months after the war's end. And note the, the, the passion here and the insistence by Delaney on the freedmen seeing themselves as serious players in what happens next. He said, I want to tell you one thing. Do you know that if it was not for the black man, this war would never have been brought to a close with success to the Union and the liberty to your race? I want you to understand that. Do you know it? Do you know it? His point here about the war never would have been brought to a close with success to the Union and liberty to your race, that if it was not for the black man, what is he referring to? Well, in part he's referring to the fact that more than 180,000 black troops fought in the Union Army during the war. It was the single greatest manpower advantage that the Un Union Army enjoyed over the South, and there's no mistaking the fact that it was a critical advantage for the Union. So the war had no greater meaning then, of course, than it did to those black soldiers who fought not only for some sort of abstract principle of Union, but literally for their own freedom. He continues, I tell you slavery is over and shall never return again. We now have 200,000 of our men well drilled in arms and used to warfare. And I tell you it is with you and them that slavery shall not come back. And again, if you are determined, it will not return again. So from the start, black leaders like Martin Delaney left no question as to what they expected freedom would mean for the freedmen. In the first and most basic sense, freedom would mean self-identity, self-responsibility, and a strong embrace of the opportunities that now presented. Delaney was addressing former slaves on South Carolina's St. Helena Island. And you see a map here that shows uh, that St. Helena was just one of over a hundred uh, islands that lined the Carolina, mostly South Carolina, but the islands actually go up all the way to North Carolina. The South Carolina and Georgia seacoast, which for decades and decades, even more than a century before the Civil War, uh, represented some of the most fertile and wealthy plantation lands anywhere in the United States. It just so happened that during the early part of the Civil War many of these islands were seized by the Union Navy and occupied by the Union Army among the first Confederate territories to be seized during the war. Here was a landscape of marsh and fertile plantation land. The soil was rich and fertile, the growing season long, and the crops produced plentiful. They included cotton, of course, but also one of the staples of the Carolina Sea Islands was rice. Growing rice for the international market made some of the slave owners quite wealthy indeed. Now once the Union Army showed up, of course, most of the slave owners disappeared. Uh, to join the Confederacy. They fled, whites fled to the mainland, but for the most part left their former slaves behind on the islands, where, not surprisingly, they kept working, no longer for their slave owners, but for themselves to feed and support their families. Here's an illustration from the period, from a periodical called Frank Leslie's Illustrated news Newspaper that shows a freedman uh, plowing and carrying on life as normal uh, on the plantation lands, uh, now void of the former slave owners. Here's an actual photograph showing uh, 
uh, a, a cotton harvest. You can see the women sitting hip deep here uh, in the cotton uh, working to, uh, to separate the fibers from some of the seeds that had not been caught by the gin. What happens during the Civil War on the Carolina and Georgia uh, Islands was in effect a social experiment born of war. In South Carolina and Georgia during the early stages of the Civil War, abandoned land was turned over to more than 40,000 freedmen, in effect creating a new landscape of freedom. A decision was made quite early on by the federal government to take these abandoned lands, as they called them, abandoned Confederate lands, uh, and turn them over for sale at public auction. Some reformers when the within the government suggested and, and, and lobbied uh, for some fraction of the lands to actually be given or sold at low cost with subsidized uh, credit and loans sold to the former slaves. And so these lands were auctioned off. Uh, and so did former slaves come to possess uh, some of the parcels, although truth be told most of it was bought up by northern investors. Nevertheless, it, it really reflected the first time in American history that former slaves now had been uh, endowed with property of their own, in effect, uh, to become cultivators in their own right. It was really a revolutionary moment. Federal government also supported uh, education and in other ways assisted the freedmen now in the seacoast islands uh, toward, and elsewhere toward a uh, transition of freedom. One of the first sort of social welfare agencies ever created in the United States, the Freedmen's Bureau, was established during the war uh, along with other agencies that uh, helped sponsor uh, the freedmen and their efforts now to become truly free, particularly with education and the erecting of schools. You can see a, um, uh, a piece of a, uh, a tract or essay, published essay, uh, that touted some of the new schools that would be established. This one here again on St. Helena Island, established April of 1862. Education Among the Freedmen was the title of this essay, and it was sponsored in part by the Pennsylvania Freedmen's Relief Association. So not all the efforts came directly from the federal government, but from similar state institutions. One man seizes the initiative on Georgia's seacoast islands in particular. His name was Tunis Campbell. He was a black educator, a free black man from the north who was appointed by the Freedmen's Bureau to organize freedmen's communities on five different Georgia seacoast islands, including one named St. Catherine's Island during Reconstruction. Here you can see a map. Here's Savannah. Remember, Sherman took possession of Savannah in late 1864. Savannah's on the mainland. Uh, but even before Sherman took Savannah, the Union Navy had possessed many of the seacoast islands off the coast from the mainland. In this case, Tunis Campbell finds his way from the north uh, to St. Catherine's Island, where he begins work organizing school uh, for the residents on St. Catherine's and other islands. This school here, this photograph uh, of a school on St. Uh, St. Helena, excuse me, was uh, this suggests a kind of typical design, a, a simple wood-framed usually single room uh, school where children but also adults, people of all ages really, would be instructed in the basics of reading, writing, and arithmetic. We'll read the quote here from Booker T. Washington. Washington himself was a slave born in Virginia who later became an educator, um, founded the Tuskegee Institute, for example, in Alabama. One of the best known black leaders in the 19th century, Booker Washington, and he described the scenes after the war. He said, few people who were not right in the midst of the scenes can form any exact idea of the intense desire uh, 
which the people of my race showed for education. It was a whole race trying to go to school. Few were too young and none too old to make the attempt to learn. You can bet I, uh, I tease my students a bit in, in class, you know, my students who appear bored with the chore of going to school and sitting through a history lecture. Uh, I remind them that no one needed to tell the freedmen how important education was going to be if they were not to be slaves any longer. What we see here is something quite extraordinary in American history, the beginnings of public education. The idea was, after all, that somehow all the freedmen needed education in some measure, and that particularly children needed a full measure of education. In 1865, black leaders formed the Georgia Educational Association to promote education for freedmen and to raise funds to help finance the cost of education. The basic goal was, quote, that the freedmen shall establish schools in their own counties and neighborhoods to be supported entirely by the colored people. Well, by 1866, they financed entirely, or in part, 96 of the 123 day and evening schools. As you can see from this illustration here, it was a biracial effort. You have young and old men and women all taking their lessons in reading and in math with white teachers uh, and black instructors as well. And because the effort was ultimately toward self-support, that is to uh, exploit local tax resources, revenue streams to support these schools. In effect, what was happening here was the birth of what we call public education. The idea that in a democracy everyone has a right to be educated. There was no public education to speak of before the Civil War. Most education was privatized. You had to pay for it. Not surprisingly, mostly those who could were wealthier, more affluent, uh, while the mass of individuals, we talked about Abraham Lincoln, for example, who was the son of a poor farmer, uh, got whatever education they could pretty much at home. This is quite an important step. Tunis Campbell urges the freedmen on St. Catherine and, 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 and the other islands to defend, defend their communities, not just by building schools and forming families and, and plowing cotton land, but, but literally to form militias to defend their communities against the attempts by whites, particularly the former Confederate landowners who were now returning, now that the war was over, now the Confederacy had been defeated, returning to the islands and once again making claims for their lands. And Tunis Campbell and, and other black leaders understood that, that ultimately the contest was not going to be decided simply by, by arms alone and, and not just by school books, but if, if the freedmen were to truly protect themselves, uh, to enshrine themselves with legal rights, for example, that, that whites would have to respect, then they would need political rights to do so, particularly the right to vote. And so the right to vote was something that from the beginning the freedmen lobbied hard uh, to have. Of course, the arguments against them, too, too uneducated, too ignorant, too poor, uh, too recently enslaved. Uh, these were the sorts of arguments that the uh, freedmen had to contend with. But, you know, it reminds me of the old Bob Dylan song from the 1960s, you guys. Uh, the line goes, you don't have to be a weatherman to know which way the wind is blowing. You don't have to be a weatherman to know which way the wind is blowing. And I think there's a lot of truth here for the freedmen in knowing which way the wind was blowing. Uh, they didn't need lots of formal education or, or even wealth to understand what issues confronted them now. Poverty, education, property. Uh, and as uh, voters, they were quite prepared uh, to support laws and, and lawmakers who would, uh, who, would, who would take seriously those needs. And in the end, the Congress agreed because uh, legislation was passed in 1866 by Congress to begin uh, enabling free black men 
Keep in mind, this was still the 19th century. Women in this country would not get the right to vote nationally until the 20th century. So free black men the right to vote. Eventually, a constitutional amendment, uh, the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, would be ratified during Reconstruction uh, and provide that voting should not be denied a person because of the, the color of his skin. We'll talk a bit more about politics in a minute. But whether it be voting, whether it be education, uh, the freedmen again understood quite well that, that those things alone, while necessary, were not by themselves sufficient. General, we want homesteads, was the simple greeting of a petition by Texas freedmen to the United States military. General, we want homesteads. Here's a picture of Friedman on St. Buford Island, South Carolina, posing once again as a group uh, for the photographer. And I think it's emblematic because that ground that they're standing on provided the surest support, the foundation under their, their feet, if you will, uh, to, uh, you know, to a future as free people. And keep in mind uh, that this was still very much in harmony with, well, I guess what we would call the American dream in the 19th century. You know, we're used to a different American dream in our time. I guess very few of you listening to this lecture right now are actually landowners. That is that you own land as property. Perhaps a few of you. If so, congratulations. But most Americans today are not property owners in the sense that they owned actual land. But in the 19th century, that was the very basis of the American dream. It's why from colonial times, America enjoyed the reputation as the best poor man's country. Uh, we had land in abundance, it seemed. And so even poor servant folk from Europe could come here and complete their terms of servitude and and foster the, the hope or the dream of land ownership. And certainly the United States government encouraged this, as we'll see, with policies that made land available at low cost uh, to farmers and, uh, and to immigrants and others. So, yeah, it was entirely reasonable for a people now freed from slavery who had been reared in a rural southern landscape to, uh, to expect and to desire to have land in their in their own right, um, to become free people, possessed of property, in other words. And they had powerful political allies, like Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania. Stevens was a congressman who, in a speech in December of 1865, said, Give, if you please, 40 acres to each adult male freedman. Give, if you please, 40 acres to each adult male freedman. This became the basis for a popular slogan you've probably heard. 40 acres and a mule. 40 acres and a mule. You see, in 1865, 4 million newly freed people in the South could now go wherever they wished, but they had no endowment of land or even shelter uh, to call their own. And so Stevens's support here for a, a land redistribution was critical to their, their, their material prospects that if they were going to succeed materially as free people they would have to have access to property. Stevens had strongly advocated the granting of 40 acre plots to freed blacks along with $50 a piece per head of family to begin buying equipment, supplies, and seed. And he offered this as an amendment to a piece of legislation called the 1867 Reconstruction Act, passed by the radical Republicans in Congress. I say radical Republicans because men of Stevens's ilk who belonged to the Republican Party at that time, remember the party of Lincoln, the party that supported emancipation, they were called radical because they supported civil rights for the freedmen. It was enough in that conservative time to be perceived as a radical if you simply supported the idea that freedmen deserved civil rights, that they deserved education, and like Thaddeus Stevens here, deserved land of their own, that would have made him, I guess, a radical's radical. Why? Well, because even his fellow radicals ultimately voted his amendment down. Forty acres and a mule is voted down by the Republican majority in Congress. 
and it really begs the question as to why. After all, during the war, near the war's end, our own General Sherman here, commanding his army, as you know, in Georgia and Carolina, issued a, a famous directive, Special Field Orders Number 15, issued by General Sherman during the war in January of 1865 from his headquarters at Savannah, Georgia, where he had arrived after his famous march to the sea. Special Field Orders Number 15, issued from General Sherman, stipulated that, quote, the islands from Charleston south, the abandoned rice fields along the rivers for 30 miles back from the sea, and the country bordering on the St. John's River, Florida. So from Charleston to the St. John's River, Florida, are reserved and set apart for the settlement of the Negroes, now made free by the acts of war and the proclamation of the United States. The islands are now made free for ownership of land to the freedmen because of this military directive. For Sherman it was a simple matter of military necessity. There were so many freed slaves following in the wake of his army's march through Georgia and the Carolinas that he had something of a problem. He could not provide for, his army could not provide for the daily needs. And as you saw, I think, in one of the letters from Grant to Sherman, the basic idea that was circulating between them was to simply turn their resources over to the slaves, the former slaves themselves, including the plantation lands that had been confiscated during the war. It made a lot more sense because it would relieve the military of the necessity of providing for the slaves, and it would also then help the Union cause against the Confederacy because it would deny the Confederates the property and resources that they would have had otherwise. But as I say, Congress voted down Thaddeus Stevens' call for 40 acres and a mule. And even Sherman's field order was challenged and overturned by President Andrew Johnson in 1866. Remember, Johnson is the man who becomes president upon Abraham Lincoln's death. The islands, most of them, including St. Catherine's Island, where Tunis Campbell established himself, uh, eventually they reverted to their previous owners. You see, the country was not ready in some basic way. The legal establishment of this country, the political establishment of this country was not ready to endorse the idea of a land redistribution. Ultimately, it was the claims of the former Confederates who, even though they had warred against the government of the United States, but were now granted amnesties after the war, it was their claims based on legal titles held in their families to the plantation lands that ultimately swayed the courts. A conservative interpre interpretation by the courts. That property, that one could be not be dispossessed of one's property without due process of law. And because these were wartime measures and not peacetime measures, now that peace had resumed, the courts sided with the former plantation owners in their claims for ownership. And by and large, most of the freedmen were then forced to leave the lands that, for some of them, they had cultivated for several years. And it really is the tipping point for Reconstruction. And it raises the question, without any kind of real material basis uh, with which to proceed in their careers as free people, can we consider Reconstruction even a success? Well. Clearly, in many ways, Reconstruction was a success, and we're going to look at the principal way I think it was a success. But in this specific regard, I think there's no question that Reconstruction was not a success. Think how different American history might have been if the freedmen had been given a generous allotment of rich plantation lands, lands that after all they had always farmed. They had mixed their blood for generations and sweat and toil in this soil to raise these crops, to make this southern economy the fourth wealthiest in the world. But now they were denied any claim over the lands that they had always worked. And as a result, most of them will become sharecrop farmers, tenant farmers, renters, or even landless laborers. And as we know, sharecropping was a recipe for more or less permanent pro uh, poverty. Uh, we won't go into the specifics of sharecropping now, but suffice it to say it wasn't land ownership. 
uh, and the burdens of paying rents of, of splitting the proceeds of a crop with a white slave a former slave owner a white landowner uh, kept most freedmen in a uh, kind of vicious cycle of poverty and yet uh, in in other ways uh, reconstruction offered something like genuine freedom particularly political power during reconstruction Tunis Campbell and other black leaders in Georgia formed the Black Republican Party of Georgia, the organization uh, which they founded declared that, quote, free schools and churches are the guardians of civil and religious liberty. Campbell himself was elected to the Georgia State Assembly. In other words, it was that right to vote that supported freedmen and their political ambitions to write laws that would provide basic protections and opportunities. This was remarkable. This was remarkable because it wasn't only in the seacoast islands but after the war in other places throughout the former confederacy where former slaves stepped forward to take part in the political system as voters and even as office holders this amounted to something like a political revolution that was really without precedent in not only American history but really world history there had never been an instance where a formerly enslaved people had been emancipated and given the opportunity now to write the laws under which they themselves would live what a dramatic what a revolutionary turn of events this was and it was argued for by black political leaders like Frederick Douglass, like Martin Delaney, like Tunis Campbell, who said that in a democracy like America, where the expectation was that all free men would have the right to vote, that to deny them, because of the color of their skin, the right to vote, would be to separate them, to segregate them, to remove them from legitimacy, and to make them permanently inferior. So they lobbied hard, and they won the right to vote. The 15th Amendment to the American Constitution guaranteed that the right to vote would not be denied on the basis of skin color. Now for many years after Reconstruction the claim was made by resentful white Southerners that this was somehow a sham. Uh, giving former slaves the right to vote was simply turning democracy upside down uh, and making a mockery of it. Well when you take a closer look at what actually happened. You see quite a different story. Look at Robert Smalls. Who is Robert Smalls? Robert Smalls was born a slave in South Carolina. But during the war he does something remarkable. He takes an opportunity to escape slavery and in so doing becomes a war hero. And here's how he does it. Robert Smalls was born in Carolina and enslaved for his whole life until the Civil War. He made his daily living, if you will, as a slave, piloting harbor ships, or piloting ships in and out of the harbor of Charleston. He was a harbor pilot, in other words, uh, a skilled pilot of, of ships that would navigate the rocky shoals of Charleston Harbor. Well, during the war, his owner had him piloting Confederate vessels in and out of the harbor. And, and here's how the New York Herald newspaper reported from 1862 what he did. One of the most daring and heroic adventures since the war commenced was undertaken and successfully accomplished by a party of Negroes in Charleston on Monday night last. The story went on to say that Robert Smalls and his associates took this vessel right here, ironically named the Planter, a Confederate uh, merchant vessel uh, that carried cotton and other valuables. Uh, Smalls, in effect, hijacked the ship. He well, he he piloted it out of the harbor. I'm sure the sentries waved to him as he passed, as they were familiar with him. But instead of anchoring the ship and waiting for its white crew to come aboard, he and his associates simply took a left turn, headed north up the Atlantic coast until they reached Norfolk, Virginia, where they delivered the ship to the Union Navy. As a, pre as a present, as a prize. Thus not only did Smalls become a war hero, uh, he freed himself in the process. Quite a remarkable venture. After the war he would return to South Carolina and win election to five terms as a congressman from the Carolina Sea Islands District. Robert Smalls. And yet despite the participation 
the revolutionary participation of former slaves in the political process and the exploits of a Robert Smalls. We know, in fact, that America would not, for example, have a black president until 2008. Think about that, from the 1880s until 2008. That's uh, you know, nearly 130 years. So something must have happened. Uh, something must have turned the tide of Reconstruction to deny black Americans their full political uh, voice. And it's true. Not only did the dream of 40 acres and a mule give way to the reality of sharecropping, but as we're going to see, the birth of civil rights during Reconstruction would also be turned in, in the period that follows Reconstruction, which we'll talk about next week. We see a kind of tragic, uh, a tragic substitute for civil rights called Jim Crow and racial segregation. It seems the story of American history and the story of Reconstruction itself was unfinished. Today, the Seacoast Islands landscape features a mix of tourist resorts, golf courses, and quaint lighthouses. You can read the little tourist blurb here from a brochure I found on the internet. These are the former plantation lands where the freed people, the former slaves, began their career during the Civil War as free people. Today, you're just as likely to see golf courses and getaway resorts. A beautiful landscape still. But the descendants of emancipation do remain. And something of the spirit of free, freedom's landscape also remains. Among the local industries of the Seacoast Islands is the sweetgrass basket-making industry. Uh, a craft skill that goes all the way back to the time not only just of slavery, but to, to African traditions of basket weaving. You can buy sweetgrass baskets off the internet today, but as the commercial says, you better have your visa card. In 2008, when Barack Obama was campaigning for the presidency, he visited Beaufort Island, the same place that Martin Delaney had encouraged uh, the freedmen to defend themselves after the Civil War. The same place that Tunis Campbell and others, Robert Smalls, had organized Freedmen's Community. 130 years later, Barack Obama campaigning in Beaufort, South Carolina, where he met and shook hands with the descendants of those people still living, still hoping uh, for their voices to be heard. All right, that's all today for Reconstruction, the Landscape of Freedom. Uh, you can go on now to read Chapter 2 in American Realities. I'll put a posting up on this, but Chapter 2 in American Realities uh, so that you can uh, continue reading about the experience of America during Reconstruction. All right, everybody, thanks a lot.